got to get up with the sun. So, so in the 1600s, this is where we used to roam. This place too. There was the map. In the 1600s, there were no boundaries. Okay, no laws, no nothing like that. Okay? So we have freedom. Before the Spaniards came and gave us the horses, we used to use dogs. Okay? Dogs were the first animal that we used when we wanted to move our stuff around. We always followed where the food was always the best. All the time. We're nomads. The Mr. Apache were nomads. Never stayed in one place too long. And if we did, we'd get in trouble because we eat everything. <laughs> but we wanted to come back. So it's just like us picking plants. We don't take all the plants. If you want more to come back, you gotta leave some. And some before it. We say thank you all the time. And our words were saying, welcome, be shahed. You know what I mean? Manu That means good day. Have a good day. Okay, I'll pass talk again. That's how we say it in our language. In our language, we got no word for love. And we got no word for goodbye. Okay? So that's the way we are. Our language is kind of hard to learn because it's different. They say a lot of the Canadians, some of the Canadians, they said this lady over here was asking me about Canadians. They speak the same language. No, we don't. But we can understand each other. It's just like the Navajo. We can understand each other when we talk to each other. We're pretty close. So in the 1600s, we roamed all over. All over the United States. There was no boundary, no nothing. No, no diseases, no death. But we stayed as family. And that was very important in those days, in the 1600s. Mayan medicine comes 16, in the 1600s. That's where it comes from. That's how much I know about myself. So it's pretty old. And I take dog gone to the river. But I take care of 6,000 Indians up there too, Miss Clara. Every day. It's not one day or two days. It's every day of my life. It's a task. It really is. But I do it because I was born into it. That's why. I'm the only boy in my family. My grandmother always told me, they're waiting for you to get a little older. And I did. Not really old. <laughs> but, you know, we, we lived really well in the 1600s. Then came Spain, the Spaniards, because they were looking for new land for the king, for the queen, for themselves. So they decided to come to Miss Clara one time. So we fought with them. Yeah, we did. My reservation, my people, Miss Clara, we had seven leaders. We didn't have just one. The seven leaders had seven different families that lived together. When it came war time, we all came together and we fought. But we were smart. We watched the battle first to see how we're going to use their weapons against them. And we did. We made our lances taller and longer. We made our shields bigger and we bowed them around us. Buffalo. I, then we, we got the buffalo hide and soaked it, heat it, soaked it, heat it, and while it shrank, it got like a sponge, we put it around our horses, the armor. So the Spaniards fought against us, okay? They didn't like it because we used their own pain tactic against them. So that's what we did. 
So they gave up on us. Then they gave us the name Mezcal because Mescalero is because we eat a lot of Mezcal. In wartime, you don't have no sugar on the war pill. And they loved it. The mezcal you're eating right there has a lot of vitamins in it. It really does. It's good for the heart and for the blood system. That's how we ate it. That's why we cooked it. So we, we ate cactus. Oh yeah, we ate a lot of it. But you know what? It's very good for you. There's nothing out there that's, not, that's bad for you. My grandmother always told me the red ones are the ones you don't eat. Because the red ones are the ones that kill you. But everything that's green out there is good for the body. So I'm an herbalist also. I do that. And Mr. Arrow. So, you know, that's one of my healing projects I do for the people of Mr. Arrow. Especially with diabetes and cancer. And let me tell you, it works. Just gotta keep going at it. Believe in it. That's the thing. You gotta believe in it. To help yourself. So we fought against the Spaniards. There's a cannon still over there in this area where the post office. That used to be a swamp. They put it through there. And they couldn't take it out of the mud, so they just left it. So we didn't bother it, we left it too. So it's still there under some more mud and pavement. Okay. Still there. I, I work in the museum of Miss Farrell now. I'm a director there. I've been there only a year and a half, and I've already filled the whole place with things that people have been given back to the tribe. And there was a lot of stuff that was bought back in the 60s and 50s. But we had to live also. The arts and crafts is what we can put, put, put money in our pocket to we can get food and stuff for our families also. There was a lot of people in Mr. that did beadwork, a lot of um, tequila like, and they made it. We still hung on to our tradition though. It's very important, our tradition. A lot of people don't hang on to it no more. They don't know how to use it. It's not very hard. As long as you know how to use it, you'll be really, you'll be in good shape. Let me tell you. That way you can hand something down to your grandchildren to the children. Don't even have to be related to you, but they're a part of you. It's very important that we do that as elderly people. I never thought I'd live this long, but I'm still going for it. So my parents, my dad never lived over, 60, over 50. My mother did. My aunt, she died at 110. She was one of the old ladies in this Okay. She taught me wow, too. She made this yellow shirt that I'm wearing. That was back in the 70s when I first started my, my big thing in this Flero with the medicine part. So I'm proud to wear this shirt. She made me two of them. I wear them all the time, sometimes. But it's me. Know who you are and where you come from. So when the Spaniards used to put down their arms, they used to come with us and go gather them with cow and help us cook it. Because they come beat us at war. So we took them in, they helped us cook it, but they loved it. They loved the taste of it, they liked the vitamins of it, you know. And they, and they had the sugar to it. And that's why you don't have it on the battlefield. So they finally got enough of us, I guess, and they went up to the Pueblo country. 
They have coffins on the hills. You can go up there by three rivers and on up. It's a trail for the Spaniards to follow to where they went, all the way up to Santa Fe. There's nine tribes up there, Pueblo tribes, and they were conquered by the uh, Spaniards. Because each and every one of those Pueblo people have a church and their plaza. You ever go to the church? You find a piece of armor, a sword, and a helmet in each church. Us Mescaleros, we don't have that. The reason why is because we believe in who we are and what we do. Yes, we want to get the Comanches, Mascalerando, and the Navajos. But you know what? We still have our own faith. They put us in prison in Fort Stanton one time. Five years over there with the Navajos. All because they wanted land. So that's why they put us for a while. Until one day the United States President, Richard S. Grant, came down and visited with us and said we didn't want it. He said, he said, well, I want to give you Fort Sumner. We told him no. We want Sierra Blanca, where we used to always come from Bozi. Where we live at right now, the big mountain, is a holy mountain to us. That's where we spent a lot of our summers, because it's nice and cool. Winter, in the wintertime, we went down to the Guadalupe, where we started gathering mezcal and different plants like that. Nice. But that's what we did. As soon as, as soon as summer got started getting hot, we go back up to the mountain over here. Soldiers couldn't find us. When we had wars with the Confederate Army, which they lost, we came this way. The United States started you gave them land grants out in the 1700s to all these people that lost the war. They needed a place to live, so they started taking Indian country away from us. But we fought against them too. So, you know, we were always fighting okay, the, the Indians. All the Indians in the United States are always fighting for what they believe in and what they used to belong to them. It's never going to be the same. It's never going to be. It's going to be where it is now. That's it. We have to deal with it just like everybody else. Deals with mortgages and all that stuff too. <laughs> I mean, we're very lucky for what we have. 460,000 acres, that's what we own. We don't pay for water because it comes out that mountain that belongs to us. But you know, we still fighting for what we believe in. The Indians didn't get to vote in the United States until the 60s, okay? Finally, we got to, we got to vote in the United States. I mean, really. I mean, you know, we, we, Indians all have some bad luck sometimes, okay? Canada has some of the worst. The dirt, the people up there, all these Canadians that have companies that are buying up the land, making oil, they're making gold, they're doing all kinds of stuff, and ruining the water for the people. I see it. You know, I've only been there a year and a half over there at this museum, Miss Calero, and I see and people come in and see all kinds of stuff that's going to start happening. Predictions. And I sit there and I listen to them. 
Mr. Ridolfo. It's, it's a tourist town. You know? If you see some of the pictures that I have back in the 50s, it was nothing but bars there. <laughs> bars. There are no hotels, no gift shops, just bars. <laughs> but you know, we live through that too. Our reservation used to be a dry county at one time. No liquor. None. Until this one guy put the bar right under the reservation line. Then we couldn't say no. So, you know, I'm pretty sure he had made what he wants to make. So. We dealt with that too. A puberty right. A long time ago. I remember back in the 60s and 50s, we can only have it on the 4th of July. Because it's Independence Day for the United States. That was the only time we could have a ceremonial. But you know what? We got out of that too. Back in the 80s, me and this one man that was a Medicine man, he was my teacher. He said, let's take it out. Let's don't have it over there on the Fort July no more. So we took it out in the woods, and nobody said nothing. But now it's still like that. And sometimes you gotta cross that line to make something work, to make it happen in your life. But the important thing about things in the Apache life is know who you are and where you come from. The language is there, but do you know where you come from? Each and everybody in this room comes from somewhere. You really do. Because when they come to the museum, that's what I tell them. This, this one guy even cried to me for what I said to him. Learn who you are and where you come from. Well, I don't know the language. You can always buy it on tape. <laughs> but you can't buy it to where you come from and who you are. He said, well, I come from Switzerland. Well, I'll teach you grandkids that. So this past year, I got a letter from the guy. He was from Minnesota. The house he bought used to belong to his grandparents and he didn't even know it. But he bought it. He found out it belonged to his grandparents a long time ago. And now he teaches his grandkids of who they are and where they come from. And now he's a happy man. Because I told him something that he needed to hear, I think so. Sometimes that's all we need is to be heard. One on one sometimes, it's always the best thing. I've learned, let me tell you I have, I'm half Mexican also. So I went through my period of prejudice, as you could say. Even my own people did that to me too. For six years when I went to school, elementary school, went down to junior high six years down there too. And it was a Spanish town. We didn't like it then. Had to go through that period of time. So I went through both worlds, people. I really did. And I always pray that my kids, my two kids, my son and daughter, don't have to go through that. And you know what, they're not. They're doing well out well there. And I'm proud to say that we made it out there. And then now they're making it, and they made it already. They got good jobs. They take good care of their kids. I have a son that don't have kids, but he takes care 
of a family that don't belong to him, but he, they call, call him dad. And they call me grandpa. Oh my God, it's so good. Tell me I know who they are. But they know. But they are Apache also. Our medicine teepee is over 200 years old. And it's still going. It's still going. We still use the old Apache in there of our language, the Miscalero language. I don't change anything in there. I've gone to so many teachers that I've learned not to be changing anything. And I don't. It's better to have something that's real than fake, to tell you the truth. These girls that are coming into age from 13 to 14 years old, I want them to have a good life out there. And they need to have a good life out there. The world, the world this day is pretty rough. The new generation, they call it. I'm still trying to understand them. <laughs> Let me tell you. Probably put me in my grave. But I was looking at, you know? Really. The way they think, the way they do things, are so different. Because when I was younger and I didn't have no respect, you know what? I got the belt. I mean, that, that's the way it was. And no other. Even when I went to elementary, when I went to other elementary school, where teachers used to thank us for talking our language, for saying anything in our language, because most of them were retired nuns. And it was, it was rough. But they didn't take that away, because when I got home, that's when my language, the English, went away and the Apache came back. I didn't give up. I couldn't have given up. Because I'm part Mexican too. Even back then, my, my mother, my grandmother, used to always tell me, they talk more Mexican than Apache when they were growing up, because we lived so close to the border right down here. We're 90 miles away from the border here. We used to run back and forth. Back in the 1700s, this is when a lot of things were starting to happen. They start changing. Okay. 1800s, it got worse. A lot worse than we could ever figure. Now it became a reservation. No more freedom. Our president of the Mr. Apache tribe used to always have to check out with the BIA before he went anywhere. In and out. Where he was going and when he was coming back. That's not freedom. Really. You know, it, it, you know, we used to have not too many trucks, but we rode a lot of horses. A lot of horses. And then became the tires. Then became trucks and cars and all this other good stuff like that. You say now? Back in the 1920s, they said that they were having a feast. This old medicine man stopped singing and he started talking to Apache of how much we would change. He said, we're going to live under a spider web someday. He meant power line. He said, there's going to be a, a bottle with black stuff in it that's going to kill people. Coca-Cola. <laughs> Not good for bad weather. Really. <laughs> that is true. The airplane that just carried one person would carry many of them to where you need to go now. The hooves of the horses are going to change to tires. 
all of it. But the horse is going to come up to me. Okay. This was back in the 1920s, and he was just mad with the beats and stuff. He said, we're going to build a building here in Mescalero so we can keep count or keep control of the non Indians running all over our reservation. We didn't know it was going to become a casino, but he did. <laughs> In the 1800s, we used to play cards. I was doing some research on that. So I made a copy of all those cards. I made them out of cowhide, because that's what they were made out of. And we used, to, we used to gamble, because we were bored, because there was no war going on then. <laughs> so we gambled with horses, sheep, blankets, stuff, that kind of stuff. There wasn't currency. But we develop games for ourselves so we won't be so bored. Back in 1875 is when we got our land, our reservation. That's when it became our reservation. In, 18, in 1867 is when they were still trying to decide they're going to take where we live at now or I'm going to put us in the desert. Hmm. But we got what we wanted. It's because we believe in something. We believe in our land. We believe in our water. We believe in life. That's why we got what we have now. Our ceremonials keep, still keep going. The families put on the ceremonials. They say we get paid by the government every month. That's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> government doesn't have to do nothing for us no more. And our reservation, the only thing that's government is the Bureau of Indian Affairs would be the police and the state. The rest, we get ourselves. We have a sawmill. A little fish factory. We have all kinds of different things going on for our tribe to make money for ourselves. And you know what? It's the people that are doing it. Putting these things together and making it work. That's what it is. Our president, I'm calling him the new president because he speaks fluent Apache. We have a vice president that talks fluent Apache. Those are very important because that's what they believe in, is our language. We have a school now. Instead of getting transported down, what, 20 miles down the road, we don't have to go nowhere now. K through 12, brand new school, 10 years now. I used to teach there. I taught art and culture. Most of the time, I have my students outside doing cheetah poles, making mezcal. We even had to do their own dance costumes so they'll know. That's what I did to these, to these kids. And you know, their grandfather and grandmother were very proud of that. You see their young nephew or somebody um, singing an Apache war dance song or singing an Apache. They said, who's that? It never happened. It's still happening. We teach the language there now. From, from freshman to, um, to be a senior, you got to get credit now to graduate. You got to know Apache. Been waiting for that for a long time. We have a dictionary that was already starting to be written in the 60s. Now we have a big dictionary. We, have, we even have some of the languages on TV now because of the technology that we use nowadays that these kids use. 
our kids, my kids, my cousins, they're all related to me. But I'm proud of them because they're still doing what they have to do. Our reservation has 6,000 people on there. And they're all mixed breeds. But they're still a country. That's the way I look at them. Always wanted to be caught. There's always time to be taught and have quality time for the little guy all the time. Because they're our future. Down the line. And I want to see that happen before anything happens to me. So now I have 13 young men. Chiricahuas had Banquet Colorados, 
Victoria, Geronimo, and Nike. These men were selected as leaders because of their abilities in peace and war, their generosity, knowledge, and kindness. It depended on uh, if they were going to go to war, uh, they would uh, select a chief that was a good warrior, that was a good strategician, that uh, was good at, uh, at handling warfare. Uh, he would be selected, but only during that, that period. If they were going to go on a large hunt, then they would select someone that was a good hunter that could strategize for hunting. They take them, if they were going to go on a buffalo hunt, they go get someone that leads them on that buffalo hunt. But only during those times. And then otherwise, they reverted back to those family troops where their uh, uh, head man was the elder or someone that, uh, that uh, led, that, led that particular family troop. And the women were as free as the men, they could do everything, but the work was divided because of, uh, because of the, the times. The men were the hunters, they were the warriors, they were the uh, providers. Uh, the women, of course, had to take care of the children, they had to uh, raise the children, they had to gather the foods and uh, take care of the skins and whatnot. But uh, each had their, 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 their place. It was because of necessity, not because of, uh, of, of gender or, or race. There were some women that uh, did go into warfare. Everyone was equipped for warfare. Everyone could fight. So it wasn't just entirely for men. If they were attacked, the women could fight as well. During the administration of President Abraham Lincoln in 1863, by his orders as chief commanding officer, 480 of our Mescoral people were forcibly removed from our sacred White Mountain area, a small portion of our territory, what is now known as the Sierra Blanca and the Sacramento Mountains, and imprisoned at Boston. creation story, and specifically if you believe in uh, one God, demons, and a life after death? Uh, we always believe one life, okay? No death, okay? So, I'm going to give them that in a minute, okay? Since the film kind of I'm going to start doing stories now, okay? Kind of change it up a bit. One time over there by the Guadalupe, okay. 
with four pecky maidens, Miss Farrell, gathering stuff, fruit and all this other stuff. And some cattlemen came upon them and started chasing them. So the women start running. They just all running. Well, they're running. They got the buckskin and they turn it inside out and lay down on the ground. Stayed there. They moved. It was down. These cowboys were looking for them, looking for them. To find them, then they rode off. What happened? They turned into a rock. So when they left, the cowboy left, got up, put his buckskin back in shape, and went back to the village. We, as the Pakistani people, always taught each other to be silent. If you weren't silent, you were dead. Okay. Like over there, Wake Tank. A lot of people used to go over there and take refuge there for a while and rest. And we were part of it too, the Mexican people. One time some Spaniards came through looking, looking for the Indians, the Apaches. So the lady laid down her, her son, she laid down by her son and tried to keep him quiet. He went and yelled out and he died. That's why we learn how to be quiet. I did a feast this past summer. I probably got four words out of the girl I was singing for her. And she was she's even closely related to me. But I thought about it, okay. Why is she so quiet? How come she don't say good morning or anything like that? She always left. But I took that as an honor thing, okay? Because that's how we that's how we taught our children. I taught my kids the same thing. It's just a trend that's been handed down to us like that. Okay? Life or death. That's what it's all about. It was about. And I looked back and I, and I see these people over here, we go take. So what happened to them? There's more tragic in a family than good. It's always been like that. All the time. Any family. I didn't grow up in the PC world either. I want to talk about the town dancers now. The town dancers, Diane, you call them. They are a sacred mountain spirit dancer. Back in the 50s and 60s, they used to call them devil dancers. You straighten that out real quick, though. Now they finally got the right name. The mountain spirit dancers. They come from the mountains. One time when they came to us, we were being chased by the cavalry down in Guadalupe Mountain from this side. Two men got hurt. One went blind and one went crippled in the war party. So the warriors told them, we put you in this cave. We'll come back after we take off the cowboy off of us. Because they're throwing us down. So the two men agreed to it. But we will come back and get you. So the war party kept going with the two men inside the cave. 
We gave them all their rations so they won't starve and wonder. So the war party took off. Well, these two men that were in there, after the second night they were being in there, they could hear singing, but you heard here. But that singing on the drum. And they told them, listen to the sound. Learn them. You're going to need to. So the two men listened to the songs and, and they picked it up. And one night they were asleep and they could hear jingle. Something going. Ooh. It was a dancer. Jesse came to them. Look what I'm wearing. Look how I dance. So they did. So the dancers went over there with their swords and put them on them and took the band off of them. The man that couldn't see, he could see again. A man that couldn't walk, he could walk again. So they finally took everything and they went back to the village. They go to the village. This is what we learned. This is what happened to us in that cave. So now we have the passion where you have the bomb square dancers. They're heaters. That's what they are. They wear lightning down their arms, and that's what they deal with. They're very precious to us. They're the ones that kept us alive when all these wars were going on, being chased, being killed. They were part of our lives, big time. And to this day, they still exist. The Karakawas, they have dancers also. It's like up to the Solero. They're a little bit different, but they serve the same purpose too. Like I said, when they came to us, the Karakawas, in the Lapan, we didn't stop them from their tradition. We let them learn and to do what they had to do in their life. And that's the way it went. There was a battleground over here in Carlsbad too. There's this one guy who was working over there at the museum for the animals in Carlsbad. He found this. It's a battleground. It was a battleground that we had a war with the cavalry. What happened is that some of the some of the missionary people went in went off the reservation and they took some of the, the farmers' cattle. So he went back to the Fort Sumner and reported it that oh these Indians took some of the cattle. So they gathered everything up, the soldiers and everything, and they were ordered before they left to capture a woman and a male young boy. They were ordered to do that. So they went looking for the, for the Mr. Arrow, the warriors. <coughs> they found them in Arroyo, where they were camped out at. So the battle was on. They had this one lady and her child against the bank of the Arroyo. They were ready to go capture them and take them back to the fort. Never told them why or how come. So the lady took her life and took the child's life too. Because she already knew what was going to happen. After that happened, the lady came running out of nowhere, he said. He said it's written down in, a, in some memory book. He came across and started shooting at the soldiers, man. Went across the road, jumped up on the bank, and was gone. 
It's just two, like a, like a mountain lion. Two or three men, three soldiers before she got her another kind of thing. So the Mithril people always had the women behind them all the time. When the man went down, the woman took care of the rest. That's the way war was for us and for the women. The women were very important to us. We always say we won't be here if there wasn't a woman in our way. But that's how much respect we have for them. That's why we still have our ceremonial. But you know, times have changed too. Everything has gone high. Vegetables and stuff like that. We used to be number one in agriculture too here in New Mexico. We grew corn, we grew potatoes, we grew squash, pumpkin, wheat, barley. Well, that's what we did. If you go to Colorado and you see those railroad tracks down there, they went upon the reservation where they logged that. We used to have a mill but we still have a mill there. Those old cats when I was a kid, we used to go over there and pick them up like we were freaking muscle men. I even still have some of the railroad tracks tied. Kid over there, Mr. Arrow. To remind me that there used to be railroads that went to Mr. Arrow. So you know, we've, we've gone through a lot. Progress, okay. what we learned from it. Back in the 40s, when they had, um, when everybody went broke in the 40s, we didn't feel it. We never felt starvation, anything like that. Because we were one of the biggest horticulture people in New Mexico. And then the cattle. But you know, we can make it. We still can. The new generation now, they're lazy. They don't want to have gardens. I have a garden. But you know, my kids don't. Hey, I need squash. <laughs> but they have the same opportunity to grow it too. So tell them, I tell them, I'll be going to plant squash. Save the seed, but you can make yourself a garden. So this side here, they did a pretty good job of making a garden for themselves. They're not all very happy about that. Because now I have some of these. But you know, this new generation is, is pretty, they're pretty rough. Okay. You know, they don't work like we used to. And some of us are still working. I know I am. But you know, we, we have to do something, okay? Because it's the way of life now to keep things going. Keep going forward, not backwards. I always tell my kids that. My grandchildren. So I'm teaching them Apache. I try not to talk any English to them. And one is Apache and one's Navajo. Mm -hmm. So, you know. But they're learning. They're learning. I'm running out of things to say to you people. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Where is your museum, and is it open to the public? Yes, ma'am, it's open to the public. You can take pictures in there if you want. Um, there's no entry fee. It's just donations, okay? Um, the donations I want to use this summer to put murals on the place. It needs to be brightened up, you know. Where is like, that? Just like, just like this shirt right here. Uh -huh. right. Where is it? Yeah. It's right off Highway 70. Um, it's 102 
Caracalla Drive, but there's no sign to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have one gas station in Miss Fair that has a big old tall sign. It says gas for sale. <laughs> you turn there. You turn to your right in the museum right there. There's a big sign that I made when they had COVID. I made a big old sign for it. Yeah. So it's right there now. Um, I'm going to start staying there at least probably from 7 in the morning to 4.30. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start I'm going to start working on weekends. So, you know, right now it's kind of slow, so I'm, on, I'm only open from 7 to 3.30. But so, parts is coming around the corner, so I'm going to fly my kite and I'm going to start opening from 7 to 4.30. <laughs> and if you call, I'm going to try to be there on weekends also. But if I'm not, call me. I'll leave my cell phone number. Call me and I'll go down there and I'll open it up for you. I want to live five minutes away. You know? Yes, ma'am. What kind of housing is most of the level of I know there's been some sick questions with Wow, that's an arbor now? That's what you use for harbor. Oh. A lot of time ago, we used to live in them. They're called Wiki Up. Um, there's a story about that too, about the Miss Soleros. The war party of them wandered off into South Dakota. We used to wear the war bonnet, the Miss Soleros people. So the two liked our war bonnet, and we liked their cheapies. <laughs> that's how we got the cheapies. <laughs> But we used to have um, the Miss Ferros, every time they built a wiki up, it was biodegradable though. Within half a year, it disappeared. And you only find a ring of rocks. That's the way we were. After we have a war, every time we had a battle with somebody, we went back over there and we picked up all the brass. So nobody would know not to bother. There's not a really a lot of books and stuff about the Miss Merrill people. Because we're pretty quiet people. We kind of stuck to the south, you know. Um, the Chair Cowboys, like Geronimo them, they have a thousand books on him because of what he did. You know, he was fighting for his land for his people, you know. So he made he made a big he made a lot of history. Us Miss Merrill we did we're kind of quick, you know, we all slow down these people. And every time we went to battle, we made we made a bell and we put them on our horses so the people would know where we're coming. That's the way we went to war. And also, how, did, um, how much influence did our house have in the I think for influence. In 1500, that's so what we ate a lot. Because some people in this area, they know we didn't have books for a while. Uh, we knew you would get that right, that's how we used to hunt buffalo. There's a place over there in Rollingwell, it's a private ranch. It's where we used to run the buffalo off the cliff. The women used to be on the bottom. And we start cutting up the meat where we take them. Because then we just go and arrow and stuff like that, you know. So that's what we hunted on, a lot of buffalo. Too. Yeah. Did you all see You know, I was looking at some pictures the other day. I have about 2,000 pictures I'm going through. Mm -hmm. And I found, I found all these, these um, headstones and these pictures of who they were mm -hmm. on record. So I was like picking out. And then I found some stuff on the veterans mm -hmm. from the scouts all the way to the Vietnam War, the World War mm -hmm. I, World War II, you know. Mm -hmm. I found some. Um, the history on that, of all the names that participated in every war. We even have some that won the Medal of Honor in this scenario. I remember this one old man when I was a younger man, a younger man, uh, he used to tell me some of his war stuff, when he used to drink, you know. He told me he took a whole battalion of tanks off one time. 
because he got bored of sitting in the box. So, and he just took his life and went through it. You know, so, there are those kind of stories I, I hear. You know, and all my, most of my cousins have gone through Vietnam and things like that too. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of census numbers. When I got my census card, to say I'm a number, I was 1,002. Back in the 1960, 1965, we became a number then. Yes, sir. Do you have any stories of the Sunday Monster Pits of how those ones were used? We use them for covers, mostly. Yeah. Um, even Victoria was with me there. We found in Mexico. We tore the peaks over there and by by going over the mountain in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. to your right, there's you go there's a place called the Tory Peak. What it is, it's just a big old it's a it's a big old board and they had a peak that came out of it. That's when the government soldiers came in and were taking the Victoria people. So he left four of his soldiers behind to keep the Buffalo soldiers off the people. And they came right into this place mm -hmm. and went down to Mexico. The little day, Victoria's family and all them, they all still live down in Mexico. They're still alive. But um, I went down there about 10 years ago and I missed it by 50 miles. They're mm -hmm. So I was like, Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but they still hold their language, they still do their pieces and stuff like that. Any more? Before I go to my home? <laughs> <laughs> to my koa? To my home koa. Well, it's a pleasure, you guys. It really is that I, that I came here to talk to you guys. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for coming. It's a fantastic tour now. Uh, we are extremely happy. Uh, please consider uh, helping the museum do donations, get a membership if you don't have a membership. That's how we are able sometimes to bring up that program and we are into it. Uh, also, let you know we were recording the lecture today, so it will be on the YouTube channel of the Theater of Back. Who will be available for you to go through. And I apologize about the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, our computer is very old. <laughs> <laughs> we have the echo in the Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's going to be on the, on the YouTube. City of El Paso. Okay. If you're going to City of El Paso YouTube, it'll be on there. Okay. It'll post right here.